Good evening, everyone. Good evening. It is indeed a joy to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, thank you, I would say, for the topic. I do wonder how I did get this topic in the morning of the end of the morning. I thought about that for a little while. I was thinking about the men's fellowship. The topic for the men's fellowship was raising uh, young Christian men, and now I'm thinking this might be the other end of that spectrum. I'm thinking somebody was saying, well, let's see if you can do both sides of that spectrum there. So anyway, I'll be looking at adorning the inner woman. Thank you, Mandy, for that lesson. I certainly do appreciate that. Amen. Whenever we're considering adorning the inner woman, this comes from 1 Peter chapter 3 and in verse 1 down through verse 6. I threw in an extra verse for you. The topic was to go through verse 5, but I want to also address verse 6 as well. When we're looking at that idea of adorning the inner woman, that word adornment or adorning comes from verse 3. I want us to look at that verse. It says, do not let your adornment or adorning be merely outward, arranging the hair, wearing a gold, and putting on fine apparel. It's interesting that whenever we're looking at this word adornment, or in some translations again, adorning, depending on which one that you're looking at, that whenever we're looking at this Greek word, the Greek word for that is cosmos. Now, it's interesting that whenever we're looking at that word, we find cosmos 187 times in the New Testament. And all 187 times, except for one, that it means world. And here's your exception. Here's the exception. Whenever we're talking about the adorning, and do not let your adornment be merely outward. Now we know that this is a correct translation because it falls within the context. But I think that when we're looking at this word world or cosmos, I think that we can understand what it means. Because if we were to read it, do not let your world be merely outward. We understand that, don't we? Now, I would say that whenever we got up this morning, 
when we first jumped out of bed, that we didn't go to the car and we didn't go to work, right? For those of you to go to work, if you're retired, you might not, you probably not stay in there that way to have the day. But the thing about it is, is that when we got up this morning, we generally would probably have gone to the restroom, gotten ourselves ready, brushed our teeth, combed our hair, brushed our hair, whichever one it is. We may have shaved, right? Though all of these are verbs, all of these are responsibilities. And here, when we're looking at this passage of Scripture, as far as arranging the hair and, and wearing gold and putting on fine, fine apparel, likewise, we need to consider that whenever we're adorning the inner woman, that there is an inner responsibility, is it not? There is a responsibility of us going to the restroom brushing our teeth. We wouldn't leave the house as we woke up in the morning, would we? Right? Okay. So you're with me. You know, we wouldn't do that. And so we have a responsibility to get ourselves presentable. Well, likewise, when we're adorning the inner woman, then there is an inner responsibility as we adorn ourselves with cross. And when we think about this responsibility, it could be that a woman may say, well, why am I responsible for adorning myself? Why does the responsibility lie upon me? Do I have more of a responsibility than a man has? I want us to consider something that whenever we're looking at this passage of Scripture, that both men and women have a responsibility of putting on things. When we go throughout the New Testament, we see over and over again that we, both men and women, are to put on the whole armor of God. That we are to put on Christ Jesus. That we are to put on the new man. That we are to put on the whole armor of God. And verse after verse after verse tells us what we need to put on. You see, that's a Christian responsibility, is it not? But when we're looking at this idea of adorning the Christian woman or adorning the inner woman, and there's that responsibility that I've got to do something. You know, it's not just outwardly. It's not putting on the apparel. It's not wearing of gold. It's not the outside. It's the responsibility of developing ourselves inwardly. Whenever we're looking at this passage of Scripture, as we go back up to verse 1, and verses 1 and verse 2 reads this way. It says, Wives, likewise, be submissive to your own husbands, that even if some do not obey the word, they without a word may be won by the conduct of their wives, whenever they observe their chaste conduct accompanied by fear. Now, here's the question. That idea of adorning, what does it mean? Well, it goes back to verse 1 and verse 2, and it talks about the conduct. It is adorning our conduct, or as verse 4 would say, the hidden person of the heart. I love that. Isn't that beautiful? The hidden person of the heart. And so we are adorning that person. My question is, as we look at this passage of Scripture, how is a Christian woman to adorn herself? What am I to do? I understand that whenever I get up in the morning and I need to brush my teeth, I need to put in my contacts, I need to comb my hair, I need to get ready for today. But when it looks at the inner woman, how are we to adorn ourselves? First of all, be submissive to your own husband, number one. Be submissive to your own husband. That idea of submissiveness means to arrange under or to put oneself into subjection to. It goes underneath the same idea of being obedient to. I want us to think just for a moment that <laughs> idea of submitting to your own husband. You know, that is an idea that is quite distasteful today, is it not? Yeah, I mean, you go out and you take the temperature of the world around us concerning this idea of being submissive, and you're going to get your head bitten off, aren't you? Yeah. All right, you live in the same world that I do, right? <laughs> Certainly so. But that idea of submissiveness doesn't float with a lot of people today, however it does with God. And I'd rather side with God than anyone else. And I want us to consider that idea of being submissive. Now, the thing about it is, are women going to be the only ones who are going to be submissive? 
You want to say, well, I don't like that idea of being submissive. Well, I want us to consider as well that there are other people who are submissive. Notice Jesus Christ. Here's the Son of God. Here we see in Luke chapter 2, verse 51, that Jesus put Himself into subjection who? to His own parents. Also, when we're looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, whenever Jesus Christ delivers up the kingdom, that He will be in subjection to the Father. Likewise, when we're looking at Romans chapter 13 and verse 1, that every soul is to be in subjection to the governing authorities. That's us, right? Not just women, but men as well. And again in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 21, that we are to submit to one another in the fear of the Lord. That's both men and women, right? Again, when we're looking at Ephesians 5, 24, this church is to be subject to Christ. And so Peter's not looking at a woman and says, you've got to be in subjection. We are all under subjection to some extent. And if we're not in subjection to anyone, you know who has us. And that's the devil. And that's not where I want to be. And so I bring myself in subjection, both men and women, the two cries. But here, whenever we're looking at these verses, that the woman is to be in subjection to her husband. And the husband has that responsibility to look over his wife, both physically and also spiritually as well. Whenever we're considering this idea again, when we're looking at verses 1 and 2, how is the Christian woman to adorn herself? Look at verse 2. When they observe your chaste conduct. She is to adorn herself with a chaste conduct. Now what does that word chaste mean? That's a word that we don't use that much today. But the word chaste means to be pure from carnality or to be pure from every fault. It means to be clean. You want to be clean, you want to be dirty. Now if you're a kid, you don't care. <laughs> whenever we grow up, whenever we get to be teenagers, we start dating, we start washing a little bit more. We understand the outside nature of that. But it reflects on the inside as well. Do we want to be clean inside or do we want to be dirty? And the answer to that is clean. It is akin to the word holy. And we'll see that in just a little while when we talk about the holy women of old. But we are to be of a chaste conduct. Now, I want us to look at this word again. I understand that the title is adorning the inner woman, but I want to address men as well because I don't want you to go to sleep. I don't want you to nudge your wife and say, hey, wake me up whenever you learn something. I want it to be for you as well. But notice this, where we're looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 2, that it says, For I am jealous for you with godly jealousy. It says, For I have betrothed you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Who is this talking about? Just the women? The answer is no. But it's talking about everyone. Present the church. Notice again that when we're looking at 1 John chapter 3 and in verse 3 that it says, And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. Is he pure? Certainly he is, right? So we're talking about Christ here. But notice for those who have this hope, do you have the hope? Certainly. Certainly that we have a hope of eternity. We have a hope of everlasting life with God. And thus, if we do, that we are to purify ourselves. That's the same word, to be, to be chaste. And so to adorn the inner woman means that I must put on the characteristic of that chaste conduct. How is a Christian woman to adorn herself? I want us to go all the way down to the bottom. And I want us to note this qualifier which says, accompanied by fear. Sometimes we scratch our head. What does that mean? With that idea of fear, number three, characteristic, accompanied by fear, means to have a reverence or to have a respect for one's husband. Think about that for a moment. To have a reverence for or to have a respect for one's husband. You know, a woman might say, you know what, but I just can't respect my husband. And I want you to continue to think 
about this in the context of here you have a Christian woman, because this is what we're looking at in verses 1 and 2, that you have a Christian woman and an unchristian man. He's not a Christian. But I want us to go back to that, this in a moment. But you may have a woman in, a, in that marriage that says, I simply cannot respect my husband. And I want to remind you that respect is a choice. That we choose to respect people. You know each and every day that we respect strangers. I do. I'm sure that you do as well. People that I don't even know. People I've never seen before. I can't tell you their names. But I respect them. How do I respect them? Whenever I go into a store, I open up the door for them. I don't care if, if it's a woman or if it's a man. If somebody's close, I'm going to stand back and I'm going to open the door for them. I'm going to say please. I'm going to say thank you. I'm going to be courteous to them. And that is showing respect for them. And people understand if you have respect for them or not. And as Christians, we need to respect people. Why? Because we're bringing them to Christ. We're bringing them just a little bit closer. And you cannot bring them closer to the Lord if we disrespect them. How is it that a Christian woman who has a husband who is not a Christian can act disrespectfully towards him and bring him closer to the Lord? You can do that and let me know. But it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. And respect is a choice. He may be doing something that you don't like, but you have to respect the position. That goes into politics. Maybe there's a president that you don't like. You know, we switch them out in four or eight years. Somewhere down the line, there's going to be a president that you don't like. You may not like them, but respect the position. Okay? Here, respect is that choice. And as a Christian woman who is adorning herself, that her part of her adornment deals with respecting, that's revering her husband. Now, some may say, considering that I can't do it, I would say that that is a heart problem. That's not a heart problem within the man. That is a heart problem within the woman. Because we're looking at adorning the inner woman. Now, we can look at the man in another text. I want to invite you back. That would be fine. But the next text deals with adorning the inner woman. And if a woman says, you know, I just can't respect my husband. That's a heart problem. And we need to put on cross and give respect what respect is due. Now, when we're looking at verses 3 and verse 4, it says, Do not let your adornment be merely outward, arranging the hair, wearing of gold, and putting on fine apparel. Verse 4 says, Rather let it be the hidden person of the heart with an incorruptible beauty of a gentle and a quiet spirit which is very precious in the sight of God. So the question still stands. How is the Christian woman to adorn herself? Notice this in verse 4. With the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and a quiet spirit. Number 4 is that gentle and a quiet spirit about her. She is to carry her with that type of demeanor. I want us to look at that word gentle. Whenever we're looking at the King James Version and the American Standard Version, it uses the word meek there. It's the exact same word that which we find in Matthew chapter 5 and in verse 5. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Whenever we're looking at this word here, as far as gentle, it means a mildness of disposition and gentleness of heart, thus meek. And we oftentimes define that idea of meek as strength under control. Strength under control. Does a Christian woman need to have strength? Certainly so. Under control? Definitely. And especially whenever she is dealing with a husband who is not a Christian, she must stand strong. She must be a woman of integrity. She must have her sight set upon God Almighty and never wavering from that. Strength, how? Under control. Because she is guiding her husband through her, her gentle and quiet spirit towards heaven's gate each and every day. I want us to consider as well that 
idea of a quiet, a meek and a quiet spirit. The definition of that idea of quiet is tranquil. Do you like that idea of tranquil? All right, whenever I think about tranquil, I think about my mother and my father taking me out to Santee whenever I was a little boy. And we would go out on Santee and we would take the boat out and we would anchor down close to Church Island and that we would put out our cane poles and we would fish for bread as the sun is coming up. And there's nothing. There's no sound. Except for the sound, maybe the waves hitting against that boat. Such a tranquil time. Remember, I used to fish, and after a while, I'd lay down in the bottom of the boat and go to sleep. <laughs> Adorning the inner woman means that you must possess a spirit about you of tranquility. Yet, there, there are some women who do not have that spirit. They, are, have, a, they have a stormy demeanor about them. That they are pushing their way through things. That they are always stirring things up. That is not the characteristic of a Christian woman. And if we possess that type of spirit about us, then we need to put that spirit aside and take upon us the spirit of which God would desire us to have and that of being tranquil. I want us to consider also in 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verses 1 and 2, here looking at the men, because I'm bringing you into this as well. Notice here in verse 1, it says, Therefore I exert, for, first of all, that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and the giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceful life in all godliness and reverence. Why am I to have this spirit? Why are both men and women to have this spirit? So that we can have a quiet and a peaceable life. Why am I to pray for them? Because I want to have a life that is quiet. I want to have a life that is peaceable. And whenever I'm stirring things up, I cannot have a life like that, can I? How can we have a, a soup that's settled when we're always stirring it all the time? Right? How can we have a life that is settled when we're always stirring it all the time? And there are times in which people come to me and say, you know what, I'd, have, I'd love to have a life like yours. <laughs> yeah, I, I've got a boring life. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing big ever happens in our family. And I like it that way. I tell people, stop stirring the pot. Watch this mouth of yours. Your mouth is stirring the pot. Your actions are stirring the pot. You can't have a life like mine. You can't have a life like a mature Christian if you're stirring the pot all the time. You know? Just think about that. I want us to consider words. That there are some folks that just got to say what's on their mind. That there are people that say, you know what? I, I've got to say it because it's in me. It is boiling up. It is boiling over. Take a cold shower. <laughs> That's what you need. You don't need to say those things. Most of the words which come to our mind will get us in trouble. If I were to say everything that was on my mind, I probably would have been fired a dozen times by now. But the thing about it is, we keep the trap shut, do we not? We think about things. We think about words that are wholesome. We think about words that are encouraging. Words that will help edify and build people up. We don't have to say everything that comes to our mind. We need to be what? Me, strength under control, because I'm going to control myself. We don't need to say everything that we think. First Corinthians chapter 14 and verses 32, it says the spirit of the prophets are subject to the prophets, are they not? In the first century where they had miraculous gifts, here's the command. The spirit of the prophets are subject to the prophets. And if the spirit of the prophets are subject to the prophets, then you can... What? Why? 
because you want to be stirring the pot instead of leading people to Christ. Now, look at verse 5, if you will. For in this manner in former times, the holy women who trusted in God also adorned in themselves, being submissive to their own husbands. Notice this idea of holy women. And I will put that at number five. Holy women. It goes back to that word in which we looked at a little while ago as far as being chaste. But that idea of being holy means sanctified or separated for a special purpose. I put it here within the context of, the, of this verse to mean one who through the purity of her conduct, looking at the inner woman, is set aside for a divine service. The word is oftentimes set in contrast to the idea of being unholy or profane. To be unholy or profane. Many times we find those words in the Old Testament. When we go back to Leviticus chapter 10, we have two young men named Abba and Abihu who would go up and offer what fire? Strange fire or profane fire, or you could also say unholy fire before the Lord. My question to you is, is that do you want to be holy or unholy? Do you want to be sanctified unto God or do you want to be a common thing? And as fire came down upon Nadab and Abihu and consumed them, that if we are to have a spirit about us that is unholy and profane, then the same thing is going to happen to us on the day of judgment. And so it would behoove us greatly, both as women and also as men, to have a holy conduct about us. What type of spirit do you want to have? Do you want to be like the holy women of old? To be women of renown? Certainly so. Certainly so. I want us to notice where the holy women place their trust. Where did the holy women place their trust? Notice this, that they trusted in God. Now it may be that within our lives that we have a multitude of counselors that are around us. Maybe we have godly women who are around us. Maybe that there are some in which we work ungodly women who are around us. People who are just carnally minded. But I want us to go back to the source of our trust. Where do we go back? We go back to God. Holy women who trusted in God. David would say this in Psalms chapter 18 and verse 2. He says, The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength, in whom I trust. And my question to you is this. Where do you place your trust? Where do you place your trust? Where is your hope? Where is your bedrock? Where is your foundation? And it must always go back to God. It must always go back to God. And in the context that we're looking at a, a Christian woman and a woman who, or excuse me, and a man who is not a Christian, Time after time after time again, we must go back to the Lord. David would say, Would my mother and my father forsake me? Yet the Lord will not. And God will never forsake us. And though through trying times with a husband who is not faithful to the Lord, you've always got to go back to the Lord. I want us to consider as well, whenever we're looking at this phrase, also adorning themselves. Here is where we see in whom their conduct or whom her conduct is based. Why does she do what she does? Why does she adorn herself in the way that she does? Is it for other people? Is it for herself to show herself to be a holy person? It's not. She adorns herself the way in which she does because of the one who is in her. 
and the one in which she is trying to manifest within her life. She is doing it because Christ is in her. Have you ever heard of the verse, Christ in you, the hope of glory? Why do you do what you, what you do? Whenever you put yourself together for Sunday morning, why are you doing this? Is it for others to see, or is it because of who lives within you? And that's important. The reasoning behind all of this is important. That it goes back to God. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 10, Paul would say this, But by the grace of God, I am who I am. And the Christian woman who is adorning herself has that same mindset, has that same uh, demeanor about her, herself. And she says, by the grace of God, I am who I am. I am the woman that I am because of who reigns within my life. And if you're not, you're going to be walking on shaky ground. If you're doing this because of mama and daddy, you won't stand. If you're doing it because of your friends, whenever the time comes in which life is difficult, you won't stand. But the thing about it is, is that whenever you're doing it because of God, because I am a child of God, and that I am a daughter of God, that whenever tough times comes there, I am not standing. Because by the grace of God, I am who I am. In verse 6 it says, As Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters you are if you do good and are not afraid with any terror. Many times we go to Abraham, do we not? A lot of times when we're studying the Bible, we always go back to the faith of Abraham, don't we? We go back to Galatians chapter 3 and verses 6 and 7 that says, This is Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. Therefore, know that only those who are of faith are sons of Abraham. So we go and we magnify the faith of Abraham. But here when we're looking at 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 6, we're magnifying the conduct of Sarah. If you want to be like the holy women of old, here's your example. Here is Sarah. And notice this as well, that she obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. And again, that goes back to the idea of honoring and respecting. And it is a reflection of her gentle and tranquil spirit that whenever she comes before Abraham, calls him Lord. You see that respect there, right? And it needs to be within our families today. Not that you need to call them Lord, but the respect needs to be there, right? Your husband's going, oh yeah, it does. <laughs> That's a good example right there. But we look at that idea of obeying. What is to consider in Genesis chapter 12? Verses 1 through 3, we have what we would call the call of Abraham. And God says to Abraham, I, I want you to get out of your country. I want you to get away from your family. And I want you to go to a land in which I will show you. A foreign land. And he went. But first, he had to go to Sarah. Can you imagine what it was like for Abraham to go to Sarah? And Abraham said, God has talked to me and we need to pack up everything. <coughs> and we need to leave. And we need to go. Where are we going, Abraham? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> you know, we, we could preach a sermon on that. <laughs> but you know what? She said yes. She obeyed her husband. And she followed. Notice at the very end, whose daughters you are if you do good and are not afraid with any terror. I think probably one of the best translations I've seen is this. You are her daughters whenever you do what is right without fear of what your husband will do. Notice that within context that we're looking at Christian women with husbands who are not faithful. 
Notice that it says, even if some do not obey. It's hard to go forward isn't it, whenever you're being pulled backwards. It's hard to walk that good walk of faith whenever you have one foot in concrete, is it not? But he says you need to walk that walk. It's going to be tough. It's going to be difficult. However, with your gentle and quiet spirit, you know what? You can do that. You can do that. And you can bring him a little bit closer to the Lord. Whenever she sets her mind on God and commits her life to His trust, her life will be a continual blessing to her husband and also to all of those who are around her. That's a tough, tough situation to be in. And I don't envy any of you if you're in that situation. Whether you're a faithful husband with a wife that is unfaithful, you set the example. And as far as the women, adorn yourself. As you would adorn yourself in the morning time, putting yourself together, to adorn the inner woman. Because I tell you what, whatever you do, the blessings will flow. And you'll be a blessing to your family. And you'll be a blessing to all those who are around you. Thank you so much for your time. Amen. Amen.